Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing for November 3rd, 2021. We are live streaming from the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples. We are grateful to live and work in Alberta, a province on the traditional territory of 48 different First Nations and the unceded homeland of the Métis Nation. Today's conversation is being shared in ASL. To ensure access to completely accurate information, Closed captioning will be uploaded after the live stream is complete. This conversation for the public is being shared live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. The Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing is a regular panel of doctors and experts. We will endeavor to bring you timely, accurate updates on the COVID-19 situation in Alberta and take questions from the public and the media. The views of our panelists are their own and do not represent any institutions they may be affiliated with. We have collectively gathered here as concerned Albertans, attempting to ensure that everyone in the province has access to as much information concerning COVID-19 in Alberta as possible. As always, we will start things off with an update on the COVID-19 situation in our province. Thank you everyone for joining us again on this Wednesday with Dr. At COP26, today's analysis will be done by Dr. Gasparovic. Dr. Gasparovic will also begin today's panel conversation as we look towards preventing the fifth wave in Alberta. We are going to explore that topic from a great breadth of expert experience, um, from medical professionals to political and policy analysts. I am so thrilled to be joined by an incredible group of humans. Um, I will now turn things over and welcome Dr. Gasparovic for her analysis and the beginning of our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. Gasparovic. Oh, you're muted, my dear. Hi, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I, I'm doing the numbers today. So we had 487 new cases today, uh, 697 people in hospital, 155 in ICU, and we have 14 new deaths. My condolences to everybody who lost their loved ones. Uh, we have 4.8 percent positivity rate, and I would like to show a graph of ICU occupancy. So it's from Monday, but a graph by Robson Fletcher. Uh, so we have the black uh, area is IC occupancy of ICU beds with by COVID patients. The light red is non-COVID patients. So we see that we are above the usual usual capacity. So yes, cases are going down, but ICUs are still in catastrophe zone, sort of. So so we bent the curve, but it's not great yet. Uh, next slide, please. And here's the graph with broken the infection rate per 100,000 population uh, by different age group. We see that this green line is five to 11 years old. So primary school children, uh, element, sorry, elementary school children. So we see that they still drive the pandemic in, in Alberta and that they are not protected from infection. They are by far the most affected by COVID group right now, and they are all non-vaccinated. So today we will talk about how to prevent the fifth wave. And I would like to show some other slides. So one of the most important to me feature of the 
of the spread or property of how COVID spreads is that if you have a starter of it, so it's similar to melanoma cancer mice infestation of, or wildfire. So if you have a starter of it and have a good conditions, it will grow. Um, so the only way to really end the spread is to not have a starter. Then no matter how good the conditions for growing are, if you don't have a starter, nothing will grow. So next slide, please. So here's a little bit about the wave. So waves, we often say like, oh, the wave is coming. The wave is not coming, we are making the waves. So our policies are making the waves basically. Uh, so it's not something external. It's if we have policies that promote the spread, spread of the virus, then the wave is made. And we made already, we had the first wave and then we made here three huge waves by ignoring the spread of alpha variant and ignoring spread of delta variant and each time reopening like dropping the precautions too early if we drop the precautions at zero community cases we would be we wouldn't be in trouble but we always reopened too much and too fast next slide please so some policies don't make waves and that's elimination policy they have outbreaks, but they don't have waves. And here in Canada, we have two, four jurisdictions have elimination policy and it's Atlantic Canada provinces. So they are colorful lines here. And on we see the number of daily new cases adjusted for the size of the population. So they don't have less because they are smaller. They, it's, it's adjusted. They have less because they have elimination policy. And the gray lines are six COVID provinces. So Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. And what, what prevented the waves over there? They first, they closed at the very beginning, closed their borders and had mandatory quarantine for incoming travelers. Then they drove all the cases to zero. So they stopped all the community transmission then, and still protected the borders, still protected from importations. Then they have really, really, really low level of, they didn't have community transmission, just imported cases. They had few outbreaks, but each time they stamped them, st stamped them out. While the gray provinces, the COVID-6 had huge waves at the same time. Now we see at the end, the new Brunswick started to have different policy. They started the summer to live with the virus. And you see this brown line that is much higher than the rest of Atlantic Canada. So uh, next slide. And cases translate to hospitalizations and they translate, translate to deaths. So we had, one can see that there was much, much more death in mitigation or living with COVID strategy provinces than in elimination provinces. Next slide. And now I would like to say a little bit about the tools we have. So we have, we have vaccinations and we have public health measures. So to, um, to explain the graph, about I have to brush on what our value is so R0 is tells us how many people one person one infected person would infect on average if there are no no restrictions and no no vaccination so basically if we would have life like 2018 uh, so original variant have had R value about three so one person would infect three people and now we have delta variant because we let it grow let let COVID replicate and let it mutate and it generated new variant that is twice more transmissible with R value of around six. And then there's the um, term RT. So it's the R value at any given time and under any given conditions. Next slide, please. So here's, here's a situation for original variant that had R value R0 of three. So we could, we could get to R below one, so decline in the in the spread with vaccines only. If we would have a vaccine that is 93% efficient against uh, transmission and 75% of total population would be vaccinated. But what we had without vaccines, just with public health, and that's the, just a the theory, but what we had really without, with just public health measures, with a bundle of public health measures, we achieved our value, we achieved our value in the first and second wave in many jurisdictions between 0.5 and 0.7. We did it without vaccines and it would, and really had a, we had a rap, in many places we had rapid decline in cases. And had we kept it long enough, we could stop community transmission and 
many jurisdictions did it. Back, th back then, more than a year ago, if we would have vaccines and combine them with public health measures, then we could have this green line and stop community transmission really within two or three weeks. But now, next slide, please. We replicate and mutate and learn how to spread faster. So now we have twice more transmissible variant. So blue line is public health model of public health measures um, with the more transmissible variant. So something that would give our value of 0.6 with twice more transmissible variant, it is 0.6 times two, which is 1.2, which would be still growing spread. For, for vaccines, if we would just use the vaccines and nothing else and have life like we had in 2018, then with 80% efficient vaccine against over transmission, uh, if we would vaccinate 65% of total population, we would be able to drop our value from 6 to 2.9. If we would vaccinate 85% of total population, we could drop our value from 6 to 1.9, which is still very fast spread. It's, it's just theoretical. It's just a simple kind of vaccine math. Uh, so some people say that now it's with Delta being so transmissible, we are doomed, we cannot control the virus anymore, which is not true, because if we use public health measures together with vaccines, we can still bend, bend the curve, and theoretically we can go, get R to 0.58, like in this model. So it's just theoretical, but real life experiment shows that we can bend the curve with Delta. Next slide, please. So. This is example of Denmark. So they had Delta, they used public health measures and vaccines and managed to bend the curve and had a decline with halving of 14 days uh, of their cases. The mistake they did that they over believed in vaccines, that vaccines alone can stop the spread. And they reopened, they, they lifted almost all restrictions on September 10th. And just 12 days later, they started to have grow again growth of cases again. So now again, they are in, in sort of a lockdown uh, or, or they have new restrictions again because it's, it's growing really fast. Although they have 76% population fully vaccinated, Alberta has 68% of total population fully vaccinated. And that's the, the important thing. For epidemiology, we need to look at total population, not eligible, eligible population. Like, how much eligible population is vaccinated is not telling us more. So 68% Albertans are fully vaccinated right now. Next slide, please. Um, and in Alberta, we also showed that it's possible to bend Delta, uh, Delta wave. We managed to bend it with vaccination with the 68% people fully vaccinated with very, very delicate public health measures. We have testing, tracing, isolating, we have mask mandates and we have vaccine, uh, vaccine passports. And another thing we have that we have uh, limits of, on, on the size of gatherings. And so here's my, it's sort of broad brush projection, what can happen. So now cases are going down, halving every 16 days, our R is 0.84 more or less. So they are going down, but 0.8 is very, very slow. So if to stop all community transmission with this R value, we would need 140 days. So we see no politicians will wait 140 days. And we can see already they don't want to wait. Uh, so cities say that they, they want to drop mask mandates already. If they drop mask mandates and then we drop more measures, then our cases will just start going up again because that's how this virus behaves. So if this this is just simulation, what will would happen if in a month at the end of the month we would start really dropping public health measures and if we would end up at the growth like Denmark has had at the beginning, then basically by February. Mid-February, we could be again at full ICUs and 2,000 daily new cases. So, but what we can, what is alternative scenario? Next slide, please. That we could add extra measures that we are still not using and push this R value from 0.8 to 0.5 to 0.6. And then in just five, six weeks, five to eight weeks, we could stop all the community transmission. Once we stop all the community transmission, we can start 
losing, loosening the internal restrictions in a safe way. Because if we don't have community spread, we can gather safely because there is no virus, so we cannot infect each other with no virus. Um, and we have we have we have a lot of tools. Next slide. So one important thing is not to introduce, not to protect ourselves from introduction of travel related cases. Uh, so this on the very, very first gra graph, I had alpha wave and delta wave with this blue dots and, and, and red dots. We didn't produce them. They all came from outside. So just we didn't protect ourselves from establishing of those of those new variants on our on our territory. So we can protect ourselves by mandatory quarantine of travelers, tests and vaccine passports. Then we need tools to reduce the spread. Uh, and stop community transmission. The very effective one would be, of course, financially supported shutdown, but I don't know if our politicians would do that um, and would like to financially support people for staying home. Gathering, gathering and vaccine passports. And then there is a group of measures that I call low hanging fruit measures. So there are vaccine boosters, urban precautions and rapid tests. We still use very, 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 very little of those, and they are very, very, very effective. So if we would just use them, we could probably drop the R value to 0.6 or even 0.5, but we need to try. So next slide, please. So for example, for boosters, the thing is that the immunity, vaccine-induced immunity wanes after time, so there are even studies showing that after three months, at least onward transmission uh, effectiveness really, really gets much, much lower. But the good thing about, uh, can you show myself, like me on the, on the screen? So the super cool thing about the book is that, for example, after second dose, our level of immunity is like this. It slowly wanes over time. But then when we get a booster, on average, our our immunity after this is higher than it was after the second shot. So it's not just putting us again on the level we've been before, but most people get on a higher level of immunity. So it's it's really great to be gigavaxed. And in Alberta, we have now one more than 1 million doses available. So it's 32% of eligible population. So basically we could, we could just start boosting people now that, that had like, were vaccinated like four months ago or five months ago. So if we would, the maximal immunization rate we had was 60,000 doses per day. So basically in 17 days, we could vaccinate, like boost 1 million, 1 million people. So one third of, not less than one third of eligible. So priority should be for high risk people and people for high risk for infection and transmission so all the essential workers healthcare workers teacher hospitality workers etc and on this graph we see the yellow line how how little vaccination we do right now really really slowly so basically next slide please we could get this yellow line going up because we have so many vaccines and we have so many so much capacity of vaccinating people so we could really 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 use this tool next slide another tool is herbal precautions but probably other people on the panel would could talk much more about it so ventilation air filtration portable hepa filters in schools and workplaces which work well they are cheap like borscht basically in the scheme of everything and 95 respirators in all indoor places. And most of all, educating people how the virus spreads so they know how to protect themselves. And that's something we are really not doing in this province very much. So we could, we could really max out on it much, much more. Uh, and next slide, please. And another unused tool uh, is rapid tests. For example, in Austria, people use it massively for screening of out asymptomatic cases and preventing spread. So before going, for example, in Austria, before they use vaccine passports and uh, rapid tests because before going to restaurants or theaters, also at work, sometimes three times a week, everybody doesn't matter if they are vaccinated or not. 
in many companies they are tested uh, and before, before private gatherings. And we have rapid tests, we could do that. Next slide, please. And yeah, so basically I would really like, I understand that there are some, it's difficult maybe to do the and so on, but we have this non-disruptive, low discomfort tools like vaccine boosters, airborne precautions and rapid tests that could be really used. Next slide. And then we could not only prevent the fifth wave, but we could also have normal, normal Christmas that we could safely, really, really safely gather together with our friends and we are with our family without risking that somebody will get infected and get long COVID or, or, or even dies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gasparovich. And I will bring you back into the conversation after our next presentation. I am very excited to welcome back Dr. Persada, um, an emergency room physician from Toronto who is able to join us during our rapid test conversation, um, co-founder of Masks for Canada, an advocacy group that campaigns to control the pandemic with masks, vaccines, rapid tests, and airborne precautions, all of which are exceptionally necessary for us to avoid that fifth wave. Um, I'm very excited. He will be talking about scientific and immunological reasons around why letting COVID circulate freely is not an ideal situation going forward. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. So we hear the phrase, you know, we have to learn to live with COVID, but I don't think people understand what that means. And it sounds seductively simple. I'm going to go over some reasons in the following slides why I think that's a bad idea and why, you know, we just can't live with COVID-19. We're not, we're not evolved to deal with it. Um, it's going to cause a lot of misery and death that can be avoided. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an important paper that came out about a month ago by people a lot smarter than me, immunological researchers and the like, uh, and they put together a list um, of reasons why um, SARS-CoV-2 is going to be a threat to us for the long term. And I encourage everyone to read this if you can. Um, next slide, please. The first one is uh, there's no evidence that the virus is evolving in a benign direction. Um, the variant that sweeped the world um, since, April, um, since the summer, the Delta variant, um, was more contagious and produced higher viral loads than the wild type and alpha variants before it. Um, there is increasing population immunity, um, but you know if you listen to the what U Uyghurs um, Shaheen and others have been saying, um, they're quite worried that there could be an escape mutation. So we play with fire by assuming and trying to comfort ourselves that this virus will become benign, that it gets defanged, as some people have said. There's no evidence that that's, that's happening at all. Next slide. And also the virus persists in the human body for, for prolonged periods. Um, there are hundreds of studies showing uh, viral persistence. This is not a new thing with viruses. Anyone who's had chicken pox can get shingles later. Uh, Ebola can show up um, years after infection um, and reconstitute itself. Um, you know, viral particles have been found for months after an infected people. It's fingered as one of the causes of long COVID syndrome where you get persistent inflammation and symptoms from persistent viral particles in various parts of your body. Next slide, please. And the other thing is um, what's scary is that even getting vaccinated may not prevent you from getting long COVID. Um, this is a study of 10,000 uh, patients. Um, this is a preprint um, where they showed that, you know, ICU was reduced, risk of death was reduced, risk of respiratory problems was reduced, but the risk of long COVID was not reduced um, when you were exposed to a breakthrough infection. The reassuring thing is that because of the vaccine, and especially after the third dose, the odds of getting a breakthrough infection are a lot less, but this is not something you want to test by having um, huge amounts of viral load in the community. Next slide, please. The other thing is SARS-2 has a number of interesting issues that make it quite dangerous. Um, this is very technical stuff that you can find more background in the paper that I mentioned. It, it has properties that allows it to cause immune cells to basically fuse together and form giant blobs called syncytia. It has something called a furin cleavage site, which lets um, it become more infectious and spread more viral particles. Next slide, please. The other thing is it has something called a super antigen. This is um, a thing that, um, a property that allows it to activate all of your T cells at the same time and make them go crazy, which is part of the cytokine storm that you see. And it looks like something that you see in something called toxic shock syndrome. 
And um, you know, you can see the sequence here. The other problem is that particles of SARS-2 can resemble a neurotoxin, and that explains it could explain why people get brain fog, uh, persistent memory problems, concentration problems. And you know, if you look at the, the stories of people with long COVID, you know, there's no resolution of the, after a year and a half of the infection. So definitely a lot of worrying things there. Next slide, please. The other thing is like, there are still too many unvaccinated people in our populations in all of our provinces who are unvaccinated. Uh, Colorado is the latest state to hit a crisis point right now. Um, we relax here and anywhere in Canada and we will face the same surge because 10 to 15% of our populations are still, adult populations are still unvaccinated and the 10 to 15% children are still unvaccinated as well. Next slide, please. All this concludes, um, I think, that the best strategy is to avoid infections entirely. Next slide, please. And the goal really should be to keep cases low permanently using a variety of methods. And, you know, none of this is rocket science. It's a combination of things that works really well in jurisdictions that are committed to really putting it through. Ontario's latest examples, um, New York, California, all have seen very low case numbers after peaks and waves. Next slide, please. And like, if you look at Ontario in the last two months, you know, a bunch of factors have sort of come together to create a very unexpected uh, golden period in the last two to three months where we've had some of the lowest case counts in Canada per capita. Um, it might be coming to an end today, though, because we saw an uptick in cases and things opened up a couple of weeks ago. But nevertheless, like if we go back and retrench and adopt some of the measures on the list before, um, we can hopefully see a better control of the virus. Next slide, please. And, you know, like life is pretty normal here in Ontario. Like the 401 is as jammed as ever. Uh, malls are full and people are living, you know, their best lives right now. Um, and, you know, it's a nor the new normal involves does involve masks and some other testing and vaccine passports. But it's a far cry from what's painted, what these restrictions are painted as, as being huge encumbrances to life. Like we are living a largely normal life here with the minimal cases. And it is to stay with some precautions. New life. No, next slide, please. And what to do if cases spike again? We have millions of rapid tests sitting around. You know, now that cases are, are uh, uptaking in Ontario, I would suggest that the government, you know, deploy these tests in schools and daycares where, you know, the large number of cases are developing in that young age group, the unvaccinated age group, and in uh, other hotspot areas, especially regions that are showing cases. And this is a, a very effective technology that can be used rapidly to identify cases. Next slide, please. And, you know, what does real living with COVID look like? One that doesn't involve disabling or maiming a large part of the population. I would say, you know, you get a cold or cold-like symptoms, you get a rapid test, you take an antiviral. There's one um, that's um, nearing approval and another one just reported results today. So two oral antivirals are on their way. Uh, you permanently fix ventilation and, you know, move, um, you know, large events and during flu or COVID season indoor uh, virtual meetings. And then the question of boosters is coming up. We're already moving towards the third doses, which will hopefully help. Next slide, please. Overall, like the true goal will be, you know, a true sterilizing vaccine. It could be that this is the case after the third dose. If the high levels of immunity that we see after the third dose uh, maintain themselves over the next six months, maybe we're seeing the end of this uh, pandemic right there. But until then, like we're going to have to try to keep these numbers under control as much as possible. New line. Now, next slide, please. And policy choices do matter. I see often online people you know, talk the example of Sweden, um, but you know we have half the death rate of Sweden in Ontario. The gold exam, the, the gold standard is Nova Scotia, obviously, and their numbers are admirable. They've protected their population and kept their economy open with great policies. Overall, you know, I've tried to make the case here that life you can't not coexist. We cannot coexist with this virus. It's far too dangerous to let it circulate. It has too many unknown properties. We have huge sections of the population disabled with long COVID symptoms. We have too many unvaccinated people who could get sick at once. Therefore, you know, low cases or no cases are the best strategy forward. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Prasada. I would now like to bring up all of our panelists for some introductions and brief statements, and then we can dive into some people's questions. So in addition to Dr. Gasparovich and Dr. Prasada, I am thrilled to welcome back Dr. Hardcastle, a law professor whose research addresses health law and policy with a focus on public health law and is a regular contributor to Pop AB. For the second time on our program, Dr. Fisman. Um, uh, Dr. Fisman, if I could speak, that would be great today. A physician, epidemiologist, and sometime infectious disease modeler who is interested in using models and data to protect Canadians during the SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And for the first time, I'd like to welcome Thomas Lukasek, former Deputy Premier, Cabinet Minister, and former Chair of Alberta's Cabinet Health Policy Committee um, to share some comments with respect to the dichotomy between good science and politics. Thank you all so very much. This is absolutely fantastic because we have our medical folks here to talk about what we need to prevent that fifth. And we have our policy folks here to talk about how policies could be designed, how citizens can advocate, how we can make that happen for it all to come together for us not to have a February that looked like one of Dr. Gasparazic's slides earlier because I really don't want that at all. Um, as we dive into that conversation, I know Dr. Hardcastle has a few thoughts that they have prepared on some of those policy things. So maybe I'll start by turning things over to you for a sec. Sure. A few a few very brief thoughts on, on thinking about a fifth wave from a, a political perspective, a, a policy perspective. Um, the first is that I think governments need to stop making promises with respect to dates and open for summer and those kinds of events um, and, and goals of having zero restrictions. I think that, that we need to throw all of that aside and, and instead of promises about dates and events and these sorts of things, that, that it needs to be evidence-based and that people need to come to terms with the fact that things like masks could be there for the for the very foreseeable future. Um, second, I think that uh, particularly at a provincial level, policymakers need to stop letting other people be the bad guys and be, be prepared to make the hard political choices. And, and we saw that one of the contributors to the fourth wave in Alberta was the province being largely MIA and university private businesses and municipalities all having to, to step in and fill that gap. And the fact of the matter is they can't do as effective a job of, of filling that gap. Municipalities can make rules in those municipalities, but um, that doesn't protect the whole province. And, and the municipalities that most need rules are sometimes those that are least willing to, to make those rules. And then the third point that I would make is just that I think there have been serious issues throughout this pandemic with transparency and accountability. Um, I think that the government has eroded trust in itself and in public health officials through that lack of transparency, through those ongoing problems with accountability. And they need to start improving that, that relationship with the public and regaining public trust if they want the public to comply with their public health measures and if they want the public to heed their advice on topics like vaccinations and the way that they can improve that transparency and, and improve that accountability is I think they need to do an inquiry, um, an independent inquiry on, on the response to COVID thus far in Alberta. And I think they need to, to improve their, their transparency and stop trying to um, rely on messaging that panders to voters or panders to dissenting members of, of caucus and, and to just be upfront and honest and, and show, show the data. Um, I think that government the government needs to follow the science and to quit putting off doing the right thing while, while numbers increase. And, and so that's, that's what I want to see to avoid a, a fifth wave. Thomas, I could see you nodding furiously through that, and it is your first time with us. I would love from a human who has held a position that in a government could be some of those policies, what your thoughts are. Well, I, I fully agree with what was just said. You know, what we're seeing here is a phenomena of uh, instead of... Uh, 
um, evidence-based policy making. Uh, we have a policy-based evidence making um, to support often um, wrongful government decisions. But 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 first, we have to stop and ask ourselves: Whom are we talking about when we're talking about government? Because as you know, there are really two branches of it. There's the legislative branch, which are the elected politicians, and then we have the administrative branch, which are the the medical officers of health and deputy ministers, and and frankly, experts on on the subject matter. And and what we're seeing in a situation like this, uh, like a a, a pandemic or, or some national crisis. Um, uh, what occurs is often uh, uh, populism uh, sets in and and legislators, elected officials, start making decisions that are popular uh, among among their electorate, but not necessarily the correct decisions. And, and you see this clash between um, medical officials within the departments and, and the decisions that are being made uh, by the elected officials. And that is natural. Uh, politicians are not experts virtually in anything, uh, particularly not uh, often in the c cabinet positions that they hold. Uh, your ma your minister of health is not not always, rarely is is he or she a medical doctor. Uh, but there are steps that can be taken to eliminate this clash, at least to a to a large degree. And 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 a, a review of how Alberta has handled this. Um, this crisis uh, probably will lead us to some of the conclusions. You know, one that I would put out right off the top, uh, it is watching this, the, this, this dichotomy between uh, the Premier of Alberta and our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Henshaw, um, but there definitely appears not to be a full alignment uh, between what the advice may be given to the Premier and his Cabinet Committee and, and what decisions are made thereafter. Uh, so I would, I would uh, suggest to, to all of uh, our listeners that uh, um, uh, separating the chief medical officer and have her report direct, directly to the legislative assembly and not to the government, not to the cabinet, would uh, free her um, to, to further scientific evidence, no matter how unpopular it may be in, in development of policy. Uh, and also any and all advice that is given to, to a, a cabinet committee uh, ought to become immediately public uh, so that experts like yourselves, not me, uh, could scrutinize this advice and, and determine whether cabinet is making right decisions based on, on the evidence that, and, and the advice that is given to them. Right now, we have no idea uh, is that Jason Kenney is hearing from the chief medical officer. Uh, so, you know, those would be some of the basic uh, changes that need to happen, not only in Alberta, but but throughout Canada. And, and, and lastly, I would suggest to you, um, because uh, this has become a political game across the country, uh, and, and we see quite a, quite a um, divide between uh, certain premiers, how they handle it, for example, Saskatchewan and Alberta and Ontario, uh, for a while were aligned in, in politically aligned in how they will handle the pandemic. There ought to be uh, a revision of the Canada Health Act and, and maybe there ought to be a trigger where the federal government uh, takes an overriding uh, role in, in management of a national crisis like this one, like a pandemic. Um, so I'm hoping to see um, uh, a review, and 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 I hope that some of the things that I suggest will be some of the lessons learned. Thank you so very much. Um, we received a couple of questions that I think are well situated for the epidemiologists and medical doctors on the on the panel today. Um, one person wrote us and said that it appears that our values. Um, are starting to creep up. Small, tiny little pocket jumps, probably similar to what you guys saw today in Ontario, um, despite an overall sort of slow decline of cases, hospitalizations, and ICUs. Um, they expressed that they'd be interested in hearing op experts' opinions on this and what it might bode for winter glitch or something that needs to be paid attention to. So I guess, when do we worry about that R value we all know over one is not good. We all know getting ourselves below 0.58 would be ideal. But when we're in that sort of in-betweens, when do you as a regular human who's not a medical professional really get nervous? Maybe Dr. Fisman, I'll start with you. Sure, and that's a great question. 
Um, so, so R is basically an interest rate, right? If you if you put your money in the bank, and uh, it, it was growing and compounding, uh, you'd you'd have an exponential growth phenomenon. That's why you know you like to put your money in the bank. Um, the same phenomenon applied to uh, to an infectious disease is obviously unpleasant when you get uh, progressive compounded increase in case numbers. And that's what happens when R is above one. But to torture the bank account analogy, if you have a 10% interest rate and you have $100 in the bank, the returns are going to be much less than if you have a million dollars in the bank. And the, so the analogy with infectious diseases is, is what you have to look at is production number. And the further from one it is, the worse. The further from one it is in the opposite direction, if it's less than one, the better. But also the prevalence, because the prevalence is what's going to drive um, impact on your hospitals uh, and uh, intensive care units and what's going to drive deaths. So even if we have a reproduction number of 0 0.9, for example, but you have you know 2,000 cases a day, this is something... That's something actually I should also mention is day-to-day -day fluctuations in R don't mean anything. This, this disease has about five, six day uh, serial. So if you had 2,000 cases a day, that would be a 10,000 case serial interval, you know, for five days. Um, and if you get that uh, reproduction number down to 0 0.9, you know, 10,000 cases, the next five days are going to create 9,000 cases. So, you know, the R is below one. But because you have a lot of cases around doing the infecting, uh, you're still a lot of new cases coming in. Um, so, so that's the, the one thing is you have to look at R and disease prevalence in conjunction to know what the impact's going to be. The second thing that you really have to think about, and this is sort of, you know, this is like a bear pit that I think some of the political leaders keep falling into again and again, is that all of this stuff is lagged. So when you see the numbers go up, the response is always, well, the numbers went up, but the, but we still have lots of ICU beds. The difficulty is it takes people a while to get sick. And um, so, 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 so they're coming to the ICU. They're not going to come for a couple of weeks, by which point you're going to have a few more generations of infection, which are also subsequently on their way to the ICU. So there's this tendency over and over and over again to fall behind. And then as Gossia showed so beautifully in her graph, one of the difficulties with COVID is people are so sick in the ICU that they're sort of stuck there. So, so what you have is you have the, the spigot is open, your case is flowing into the ICU, and you have a lot of people who survive who have a long length of stay. So it just jams up the health system. So I, th I think those are the two, the two king, the things. You look at R, but look at R in context of prevalence, and also think about the fact that this is lagged. So what you see today is going to hit the hospital in three weeks. Um, that's my best advice. A lot of the viewers who tune into our program are humans like myself who are very interested in the science, in the actions that they can take, and in keeping their families and their communities safe. We don't have a huge following of anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers. So they're often sort of seeking what that even better yet is or what that next step is. And so we heard from a couple of folks who were fully vaxxed um, and are wondering, I don't know if it's different in Ontario, so I'll context this a little bit. In Alberta, if you work somewhere, you do not have to be vaccinated, even if um, that business subscribes to like our vaccine passport program. So for example, if I were working at a grocery store or working at a restaurant, I wouldn't have to be vaccinated, even though if I were at that restaurant, the folks coming into it would have to show proof of vaccine. So folks have started asking themselves, people who are fully vaxxed, what can they do <laughs> um, to prevent being exposed by unvaccinated staff in places that they visit, so grocery stores, hairdressers, or other patrons? And is it even necessary to consider that? So if they are double vaxxed, do they need to worry about the vaccination status of the folks in places they go? And if so, what added layers can they give themselves for protection? 
I'll, I'll uh, quickly mention. So I think the best way you can protect yourself in those situations, and I do this because I have two young kids who won't be who are under five, so they won't be vaccinated anytime soon. As I wear an N95 in um, in shops or in public places um, where I'm not certain about the vaccination status. So I think that's one quick strategy. They're very easy to get now. They're quite comfortable compared to you know the big face buckets that you had before. Uh, about a dollar each, and a very very good investment, I think. I could add to this that, yes, the mask, and also you can carry with you CO2 meter. And if you enter the room that is an indoor space that has will give you a reading above 1,000 or above 2,000, then just go out, go out, don't enter, because there's no good ventilation there. CO2 monitors are wonderful. I have to say they're pricey, but we, we did invest in one. And it just completely changes your perception of uh, sort of how the world works around you in terms of risk. We now have a new favorite restaurant here in Toronto down the street from us that has an outdoor patio that has a, a, a roof on it, uh, but, but is very open in the, on the patio. And the CO2 there is outdoor air. And we've been going with friends to have dinner there because, you know, it, no, it's it's a, it's a beautifully well ventilated space. I had a bit of a rant on Twitter today um, because I think that currently, to my mind, and, there, and you know, I mean, we just had the provincial government in Ontario pass on on mandating vaccination for healthcare workers, which I think is a whole other thing, and I think is a, is a bad decision. But I I think right now my biggest criticism of government, the medical establishment and health leaders is the failure to use the word airborne. Because by failing to call this what it is, they're depriving people of a mental model that really lets them be creative and improvise and protect themselves and protect their families. You know, once people understand that this is spreading like infectious cigarette smoke, which it is, you know, a lot of this becomes very intuitive. You don't need to spend money on plexiglass for your business. You don't need to be doing this endless deep cleaning, hygiene theater stuff. Hand hygiene is great. Look, COVID's not the only disease. You can keep your hands clean because there's other things that, you know, can get on your hands. But hand hygiene isn't going to prevent COVID. Um, and I think once you give people those mental tools and the stuff, Kashif is saying about N95 masks makes a ton of sense. The stuff Gosia is saying about CO2 monitors, once you understand, well, you know, it, it's like cigarette smoke. If you, if you don't like secondhand smoke and you were hanging out with a you'd probably want to do it outside and maybe step a few feet away from them because that aerosol disperses in the outdoor air. It, ventilation suddenly becomes important. Uh, HEPA filters suddenly become important. And I think in as much as Ontario has kind of had this golden fall to date, I think that's probably largely attributable to, God help us, kicking and screaming. But we got the message out in Ontario for schools. A lot of educators understand this. Open windows are common. We kept masks in kids in schools. And in the Toronto District School Board, uh, we, we have HEPA, a HEPA air cleaner in each classroom. And when we look at the data, not to get too Ontario centric, I realize I'm talking to people in Alberta and that's a good way to, you know, suddenly I'll, my screen will go black. But, 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 but we were looking at Ontario health unit by health unit this morning. And, you know, Ontario is a big place. It's, it's two time zones. Uh, you've got population clusters in different parts. Of the world. But, you know, we've hit bottom and are probably starting to climb back up. We're probably starting to climb back up, partly as a result of easing public health restrictions. But it's very heterogeneous. And I think one of the things that bothers me is the places that are climbing are actually little places. It's not Toronto and it's not Peel region and it's not Ottawa. It's not the big population aggregates. This flattening out and rise is coming from Sudbury. It's coming from uh, Haldeman, Norfolk. Um, you know, it's coming from smaller places where you do see these explosions in kids in schools. And I think that's ultimately going to filter through and cause, cause some problems for people. So I think that's being a bit masked. But I, I think if we could get people to have a mental model, just as there's this guy, uh, Satoshi Akima, who I follow is an Australian physician, said, you know, it's a cholera epidemic. It's reasonable to tell people not to drink the water with poop in it because it's a cholera epidemic. It's the same thing during COVID. And we actually do 
have light touch tools to deal with this. So we don't need to do lockdowns. It's inappropriate to do lockdowns at this point because we know enough about the science to control this with relatively light touch interventions. I had a wonderful, and this is the last thing I'll say, I had the most wonderful experience on Twitter today. God help me. Obviously need to spend less time on Twitter. But a guy who always pops up in my mentions, he has a name is like Gucci Boy or something like that. Gucci Boy always pops up. Whatever I say, Gucci Boy pops up and tells me I'm a terrible person. So today, Gucci Boy actually popped up in my Twitter mentions and said, 99% of the time I disagree with Fisman, but this time I agree. We, you know, businesses need to be able to do common sense things to protect their business and protect their, their customers. And I felt like, you know, I, I've finally been able to connect with this guy who, you know, just hates my guts because what we're on the same team now. Both want businesses to be able to do well, keep their customers safe, make money, have conf- you know, have, have customers have confidence to come back. And that's achievable. But the difficulty is that, you know, there, there seems to be this weird taboo around saying airborne and calling this what it is. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I, I, I do think there's a lot that's achievable. That but you're- actually... Oh, oh, I was going to say that was actually perfect. And I was going to throw it over to our two policy humans because one of the questions that we received repeatedly as well is how can we collectively or individuals take action to convince people like our chief medical officer of health or our CEO of AHS school boards to use the word airborne, to just be like, yes, it's airborne. What can those... Yeah, of us at home do our policy friends to make them say those magic words. Well, my comment was actually going to be on the employer employer vaccine. So, so I'll give my I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let uh, my co panelists marinate on that question while I throw in a quick comment on the on the vaccine issue. Um, I think that the one of the issues with the employer vaccine mandates is that employers were nervous to mandate their their employees be be vaccinated. And I think we're seeing the big employers do it in in Alberta. We're seeing, you know, AHS do it, City of Calgary. Some of the big employers do it, the big airlines. And I think that, and and there have already been some legal challenges. And as much as as I think people like to kind of scoff at those legal challenges and, and sometimes criticize the people bringing them, I think in some ways those legal challenges are important because I do think that for the most part, courts are likely to uphold employer vaccine mandates. And once they do, I think that will give some of the smaller businesses the confidence that they need. The smaller businesses who don't have in-house counsel, who don't really want to want to, to find themselves in the court. Once we get some of those, those legal precedents, it will be helpful and they'll be empowered and emboldened to, to themselves consider putting into place be it um, employee vaccine requirements or, or even some of the other restrictions that, that we've seen. So there's the, the sort of good news story about some of that litigation that, that I know people have been critical of. But your listener brings up a, a really good question. And, and like the good doctor said, Canadians should be able to develop a, a mental model. Uh, and, and most Canadians are rational. And if they have a model in the back of their mind, uh, even in absence of rules, uh, many can figure out what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and they will govern themselves accordingly. The problem we have here is when policies that are implemented by government are inconsistent either with each other or, or with logic. And and the employer model in Alberta is probably a good example. Love it, and and if I can borrow that that smoking analogy because we're speaking about airborne over here, um, if I'm a smoker and and now I when I want to go to a restaurant I cannot smoke because restaurants are non-smoking, but the employers and and the staff in the restaurant are allowed to smoke and they're smoking all around me, I have a problem because first uh, one thing I will conclude is that this no smoking smoking policy is 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 rubbish. Uh, why can they and why, why can't I? And I'm still surrounded by secondhand smoke. So I might as well light up and, and have a cigarette too. And and that is exactly what's happening in Alberta restaurants. Uh, those who are not keen on wearing masks, those who are not keen on getting vaccinated, um, their argument is actually legitimized by the fact that those who are serving them food in a restaurant don't have to be vaccinated. And, and, and that's how you perhaps reinforce 
wars. Um, however irrational their arguments may be uh, among the anti-vaxxers, um, they, they become even more steadfast in, in, in their decision to, to oppose vaccination. So, so again, it boils down to how we develop policies. And, and clearly, these policies were made for, for political reasons. You know, I, I firmly believe that, that cabinets and, and politicians are no different than a board of directors in a large corporation. They should set out objectives. And in this case, obviously, the objective is how do we get through this pandemic with least number one health damage to the population and then b uh with least economic economic damage damage to to the country uh but it should be the medical officer and her and her medical and her deputy minister of health and and, and other experts uh who actually develop policies and implement those policies based on the objectives that are set forward by, by the elected officials. The moment you allow politicians to make decisions on policy development impl and implementation on such a controversial issue as a pandemic, this is exactly where you end up. Before we say goodbye for our time today, obviously our focus has been on the fifth wave preventing it because I really, I for one would really like a holiday season with some people that I know and love. I would like to not spend um, the 28 days of February trapped in my home. We've gotten a lot of questions about schools, about other close contacty type places. We talked about the low hanging fruit. Dr. Fisman, you had another word for low hanging fruit that I also quite enjoyed. Uh, low impact, low touch, low something. Light that, touch, yeah. Light touch, thank you so yeah. very much. I would love to ask you, and I suspect, presume, I hate to assume, that a lot of your answers will be the same, to leave us with that sort of final sentence of what we have to keep in place what we need to maintain to keep society open. So I'm, yeah, I'm interested to see, maybe I'll be wrong, but I think it'll be some similar stuff. We'll see. So maybe Dr. Perzada will start with you and then go to Dr. Gasparovich and then over to Thomas, Dr. Fisman, Dr. Hardcastle. And I would love to hear what we need. What is that minimum? So we are three to four months away of having every child get a vaccination, um, six months and above. So five to 11 this morning, started getting them in the U.S. Hopefully, it's coming to us uh, soon. We need to keep them safe for as long as possible. And schools are basically the breeding ground right now in the hardest hit areas in Ontario and elsewhere, I'm sure. Um, what I would say right now is make sure schools have masks. Make sure adults are wearing masks in society. Keep the kids safe as much as, much as possible. Use rapid tests twice a week in schools. My, my uh, three-year-old goes to a preschool. He's rapid tested twice a week. Um, he's had three colds, all non-COVID so far. Um, he's bringing it home to us and getting us sick, but it's not COVID. And all of his classmates are safe. The entire school is safer that way. So we have just these next few months to keep them safe. Um, we need to do our part and we'll get through this hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Um, I totally agree. Keep keep kids safe as much as possible. So keep them in well-ventilated places with air filtration and tell them how to protect themselves as well because they are smart people and and give them masks. And, and if we could all upgrade our masks to N95s and higher, they are comfortable, they are very breathable, some of them, and then we would help everybody. Use rapid tests. If you are employer, test your people twice, three times a week that work for you. Uh, and yeah, vaccines, like I would like, I really don't like the idea that one million of vaccines is in the refrigerator. They don't work in the refrigerator. They work when people have them. So just boost everybody, especially frontline and essential workers. So yeah, and write to your, I don't know, politicians and tell them that you don't want to live with COVID because like, so really let them know because now we are sort of, dragged into this living with COVID and this propaganda gets stronger again. Um, so let your voice be, be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, obviously take all the medical precautions that you can, uh, including obviously vaccine.
action. Um, but I think we, we still can impact others' actions. And, and, and I would strongly discourage anyone from getting confrontational with, with those who don't believe in vaccinations or wearing masks, because this has become a, a bit of a polarized um, issue of identity and, and belonging to certain groups. Um, but we all know individuals who are dear to us uh, who are in that category of, of people who don't vaccinate, who don't wear masks. And I think is it is still incumbent upon us to pick up a phone um, and and uh, and plead with them and ask them to do you a favor uh, and and follow uh, the medical advice. Uh, but but any any clashes seem to be now counterproductive. They they, they further entrench in their positions. But uh, uh, I know of a of, of number of situations where individuals who are avid anti-vaxxers uh, finally had someone in their family get sick, end up in ICU, and as a favor to that person, took the vaccination. I think now. Um, bribing and, and, and government paying off individuals for vaccinating will not work, but, but often uh, Canadians will do it one for another. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't, I don't want to repeat what, um, what Kashif and Gosia said. I, I, think, I think the, the idea that uh, people aren't motivated by, by money uh, in terms of of getting vaccinated, that's borne out by data. And in fact, people can go the opposite direction, dig their heels in. Um, I'm gonna, my my advice, since I, I don't need to repeat what's already been said, I don't think about light touch uh, interventions, my advice is gonna be be optimistic. We're, we're very much in the third act. We, we have um, two ex- starting to happen in Canada. One is one is third doses. And you look at the Israeli data and it's remarkable what the effect of the third dose. It's a three-dose vaccine. I mean, as is hepatitis B and hepatitis A and HPV. So this one is too. So you need it turns out you need the three the third dose. The second is I think kids have been sort of the dark matter of the pandemic, holding the thing up, hard to measure because they're so often asymptomatic. When they are um, vaccinated, I think it's going to be disproportionately impactful on the dynamics of this disease. And I think we're teetering on the end, on the edge of getting senior public health officials to use the A word as well uh, to, to to say airborne. And it's very close. We're sort of rocking, <laughs> rocking on the edge of the cliff, and I think they're about to go. And I think I did see Health very... Canada tweet something with a hope open, open window. They they sent out a picture yes, with an open window they, on my Twitter yesterday. <laughs> they won't tell you why you should get windows, but they won't tell you why. But I, I think we're I think we're on the cusp with that, and I think that's going to be really helpful. You know, I don't want to go on. We're at we're at time. I think that's going to be very helpful moving forward. We're probably into a bit of an age of pandemics now for reasons we can't get into tonight. This is probably not going to be the last pandemic of most of our lifetimes. And investing in, in ventilation and safe indoor air is our version of what our what our ancestors did when they built sewers right it's going to going to keep us keep us safe to have that infrastructure so i think we're getting to a point where we can have those conversations so i obviously i, I agree with the, the the wisdom of others and and to that i would what i want to see um, happen and and what I think would be along the lines of those light touch measures is well first not withdrawing the current measures too quickly not being too eager to do that but I also think that um, politicians need to start priming the pump for those five to elevens they need to start appropriate messaging and and what we saw in the you know last last year about this time was some really inappropriate messaging from from the government around vaccines it was you can choose you we they took mandatory vaccine out of the public health act even though they were never going to use it as sort of a pandering theater to their to their base um they you know whenever the premier took the microphone about vaccines it was all about trudeau's failings at procurement and they need to forget all of that their only job now is to um is to convey the message that vaccines are, are safe for this population they're effective for this population and they need to develop strategies to make sure they're reaching all children um and, and that's what i want to see them doing now is priming the pump in anticipation for for vaccines to be available to that age group thank you all so very much
These are some excellent take-home points on how we can avoid that fifth wave. And thank you, everybody watching and or listening after today again for joining us. We will see you next week. And as um, we look towards future program planning, um, and as we ideally keep moving out of this urgency of response, fingers crossed, please let us know if there's any topics relating to COVID-19 that you would like us to revisit or visit for the first time. Um, so until next time, stay safe, Alberta. As always, remember COVID-19 is airborne. Wear the best mask you have access to. And vaccines really do save lives. 